Thank you all for attending. We're going to talk over the next 20 minutes about sustainability, and it's going to include insights specifically on sustainable design. And it's really from the trenches of what I call the energy revolution, because as a young architect coming out of Penn, I wrote my thesis on energy intelligence, and I thought there were some opportunities to learn some things along the way. What I did with a pen is I used a book like this one, which folds up, and it was designed many, many years ago in Japan for writing vertically, but I use it as a journal. So instead of a mural, I would take notes visually, and as a young architect, that was an easy way for me to digest information. In the course of this, I have built uh, thousands of linear feet of drawings, and the book that you have in front of you, Learn From Looking, includes lots and lots of images and plenty of words that I don't expect anyone to necessarily read in a linear form. How observation inspires innovation. And the idea is to take a little bit of a pause in life sometimes in a digital world and look at the things that may seem really obvious that maybe um, we can look closer at. When it comes to looking, start looking and learn from the looking rather than looking for something is also something that seems a little bit obvious, but many times you'll see it in politics, you'll see it in business. Someone is seeking a uh, decisive maybe a moment to make a case for some particular type of platform as opposed to like researching and letting the research and the observations drive what they learn. When it comes to the following presentation, we're talking about 20 sample drawings out of thousands and 60 some thousand words in this book. So again, I don't expect everyone to read the whole book, but there are some chapters that you may uh, enjoy. We're going to start with Japan. So a bullet train, 200 miles per hour, awesome. 25 years ago, I stood on the platform at 6 in the morning, and there was a woman with a brush, and she was sweeping the platform. So imagine in America if we had a high-speed maglev train. We would probably have an RFP go out to like DuPont to make a high-tech brush. The brush she was using was a 2,000-year-old invention, which was bamboo shoots bound from the local native renewable materials. So imagine how cool it was to see the most advanced form of public transportation connected directly within feet of the simplest, most elegant form of a brush. So this idea to me of sustainability started to really sink in that it's not about necessarily pushing technology. It's not just solar panels and electric cars and high-speed trains. It's sometimes those raw materials that are available and renewable that can be used in an innovative and a simple way. Here's another example of public transportation. Looking up through the wires, the cables of the trolley system at the Vienna Opera House. Well, we used to have in cities like Los Angeles all kinds of trolleys. Now it turns out that General Motors and some other groups bought those trolleys and those systems and lobbied on behalf of the Interstate Commerce Act and all kinds of things to eliminate what were really elegant forms of public transportation that were also electric and not fossil fuel based. We love our fossil fuels in America in part because we were told that the freedom of the road and the flexibility was more appealing than waiting the seven minutes between the trains. Well, as we know with traffic jams and everything else, there's a downside to using fossil fuels, which is everyone has a single passenger vehicle. You are beholden then to waiting in line at a traffic jam. What I also found, and what was really interesting with this one is, if you look in the upper right, the uh, 54 foot wide lanes for the cars had on either side the trolleys. They were flanked by, with the dotted pixel side there, the uh, strip of green, which would have the trees, a path, which was the sidewalk and the benches. There's a little kid there I saw. And then parallel parked cars, an interior road, parallel parked cars, and another sidewalk. So it was this very singularly simple concept that you could acknowledge that pedestrians had a role in the transit system. They weren't just shunned off to the side. And in a suburb of, say, Philadelphia, where I live, I'm always disappointed that there are very few sidewalks. I grew up in Washington, D.C., riding my bike to school for years, walking and riding bike a mile. 
I cannot have a 12 and an 8 year old son and daughter walk to school because there's physically no place for them to walk other than in the street. So this idea of having one, two, three, four, five, six, seven layers of lateral transportation, one of which was this very singular electric, not a fossil fuel burning system, acknowledging there were going to be cars, acknowledging there were going to be people, and that whole system tied together in an interesting way. What I do sometimes is I draw cross sections. So as a one to two ratio, with 170 some feet and about 75 feet in height, you get a look at where those trees were. So it wasn't just one row of trees, right? It was a pair of tree rows on either side with then the transportation in the middle and this idea of an alley of using that system. So are there any um, urban planners in the mix? Because sometimes with sustainability, you know, it's not so much the things we make and the things we use, but it's like the macro system of how we design metro centers, town centers, and we're going to get to that in a, in a second. Here's a toxic free design concept. If you have pressure treated wood because you do not want the wood to rot when you put a post in the ground, you have the burden of cleaning the groundwater table because we're now polluting in some form what was a natural flow from rainwater soaking through to a water table. What they did in Japan that was so interesting is they acknowledged that the lower side, which would be these pieces, was going to decay. So at about knee height, they would have a carved connection that would interlock. And over a couple decades, when the lower piece would whisk up the water, you would literally accept that it was going to decay and remove that piece rather than using toxic chemicals to treat the wood. So again, this is the kind of thinking that is sometimes the simplest solutions can have the lar largest and the longest lasting benefits. Over in Amish country, I would start to see some interesting uh, solutions for the same challenge. So here, instead of using a removable piece, they had a metal pin just to lift the post from the surface that would be at risk of attracting and bringing up that moisture. So again, not using high-tech chemicals, these were interesting sustainability solutions that would promote longevity. Modularity. Tatami mats are elegant in a very simple way for me because if one was damaged, you can remove and replace without tearing up the whole carpet. So there's some incredible statistic that over like a third of the landfills are construction debris. Imagine today in the apartment buildings and the schools and the condos, whatever it is, the amount of carpet that is being torn up and vinyl flooring and really disposable floor material that is put into dumpsters and hauled off to the landfills. You typically can't recycle it. And the challenge becomes how do we change the culture to think not about just the materials, but the systems of those materials. There are some carpeting companies that have the floor panels, which you can remove if there's one that's damaged, which if you think about it, is not unlike the old tatami mat system. The other thing as an architect that was really appealing to me from the uh, design standpoint is all of a sudden the size of the mat became the modular element to which you build. So you wouldn't have, if the mats are five feet, a 11 foot wide room. It would be 10. You start to streamline then other things like lumber size. So when I do some of these drawings, this would be a section of a house. This is a view with a sliding shoji screen folded open, as is the top panel, which is folded open with the sliding panels. There were in many cases translucent. So now you were including natural light into the system and those sliding shoji screens were also modular. So instead of a stud wall with sheetrock that would need to be torn down when you want to move a room, you would reuse. Remember the reduce, reuse, recycle has reuse in it. And so even in this case, if you wanted to expand the room, you can start to use those pieces in a really interesting way. So this gives you a sense of the size of one of the drawings. I'm going to talk specifically about what's right here with this A-frame 
on the next slide. This is for um, silk production. So silkworms live in this structure. Instead of a factory in Indonesia that makes our clothing, this idea of local became really an interesting piece of the sustainability story. That in communities all throughout Japan, they were making the material that would become the thread of the fabric of their life. Pretty nice. Not shipping it in an airplane or a cargo ship to a port that would put it on a tractor trailer, that would move it to a factory, that would have it then processed and put in another truck and then shipped in another truck to a store where those of us that have SUVs drive and pick it up. So the idea of micro-local became really interesting in how we start to look at making things. And it was one of the drivers when we moved our manufacturing for the LED lighting from Asia to southeastern Pennsylvania. It happens to be micro-local. It is close to Philadelphia, which has, in the greater metro market, 5 million people. And the East Coast, between DC and New York, has 50 million. So we put the production of the thing that we use near the place where the people use it. And these communities used the basically fruits of the labor of the production. Issei Shrine, preservation of skills. So interesting, quick anecdote about preservation. I took a preservation class years ago and we would do things like look at how Monticello was preserved and uh, you know Independence Hall and there were um, additives for the concrete or there were steel beams put in to hold what were the wooden beams that had started over 200 years to fail. And in that summer from uh, my Japan trip, having worked for a professor, I was at the most famous of the famous Issei shrine construction sites and they were um, taking it down and within a football field 100 yards away they were building what looked to be the same shrine. Here's the over thousand year old famous shrine. And I turned to Kenya Mariyamu, my professor, and I said, Kenya, what, you know, what are they doing? He goes, well every 20 years the sons and daughters of the carpenters and the plaster workers and the craftsmen and women that built the previous one are building another one. So it's not old. It's not old at all. It's never more than 20 years old. It's always basically new. But what has been preserved are the skills. The carpentry skills and the craft skills and the specialty plaster work. So it was like this shock to me. Like we've actually lost in America the masonry skills to a high degree, some of the carpentry skills, right? A carpenter now has a nail gun, right? There's not, not a lot of chisel work. And I got to learn some techniques and wouldn't even scratch the surface with these guys. But even something like this thatch roof, the skill to interconnect thatch was so interesting because it wasn't just like you throw it up there and you hope it stays. A well-crafted thatch roof will outlast an asphalt roof. Like the air pockets in the tubes, the straws of the thatch have a higher insulation value than the roofs we're currently building. Thousands of year old technology used and I got to see it in Eastern Europe, I got to see it in uh, the Yucatan Peninsula, I got to see it in Japan. Total cost of ownership and material choice. So TCO is really about investing once with a little more money and then reaping the benefits of it over time. So a tile roof is more expensive, no question, than asphalt shingles. It's good for like a hundred years. So the question becomes, how much labor, how much environmental impact is it to throw away these asphalt roofs? We talked about the carpet being thrown away. Well, imagine today, in addition to thousands of dumpsters full of old raggedy carpet, as opposed to the interchangeable tatami mats, how many dumpsters are full, full of uh, asphalt tiles? And what's underneath them is that tar paper and the rotted out old sheathing the plywood, and then there's the fossil fuel used to move them to the landfill. There's the fossil fuel used to produce the next batch of asphalt shingles, and the fossil fuel used to move them from factory to Home Depot or Lowe's or you name the big box store, and then the contractor picking it up and getting it to your house. 
So we've never really done a TCO, a total cost of ownership, for what are considered modern innovations. Well, having these tiles, and you may have traveled in Italy or seen things, it's like the terracotta roofs in Florence. That beautiful red fabric that links the different architecture. Every shape and every building size can be different, but there's a thread, a datum that connects those. Well here, these are mostly like a gray tint in Japan, and I was so curious, I found one of the factories, and this is where they would have, with the kiln-dried tiles, this wave, the glaze on them, and they would be carried down the length of the, uh, the factory floor. So the idea, it was interesting, of how they're bowed from sort of left to right like a wave versus in um, Florence, it's more like a barrel vault that's symmetrical, that kind of tapers towards the top. So each culture has had over years its own sort of twists on a similar theme. Renewability and scalability. Does anyone own a uh, bamboo uh, plant where they see how quickly it grows? Have you ever planted one or had one in a potted environment? It's pretty incredible. Like you can almost watch it grow. So we would cut down 60 foot high giant bamboo. It grows from say six inches in diameter at base straight up. Meaning it doesn't grow like an oak tree where the little seedling gets wider at the trunk. Like giant bamboo starts at that diameter and just goes up. And so over the period of, um, you know, a hundred years, you might get an oak tree with enough wood to have the floor for a house. Like in a couple summers, you have enough bamboo to make the flooring. You can use it for um, silverware. You can use it for fabric now. There's incredible new advances in how it's used. Some of those advances existed, but this is where I love that the high-tech mixes with the low-tech. Just like that bullet train in the beginning was connected in this really interesting way to the bamboo brush. I love that we're starting to push and explore how a renewable, fast-growing material like bamboo can become a resource. What's also a um, little-known fact about bamboo is it's systemic in that um, it's not like each one has its root system. It's more like a grass where it's growing and part of a whole connected network. So to harvest it, you don't have to work too hard to plant and take care of each, uh, each plant. Okay, embracing nature. This is one that's actually from this book that's in front of me here. And I'll just pass this around so you guys can, uh, can see it. But the idea of this little um, story that I, that I love was walking from the tatami mats to the deck to a large stone to a medium-sized stone to smaller ones over gravel and then the pe pe pea gravel that was raked had this little connector that said you can go left or right. What I loved was that it wasn't like there was a door between the house indoors and the yard outdoors. That the roof would cover this and it was open with those sliding shoji screens so that you were inside protected from the rain, but you were um, in nature in this intermediate space. So the sustainability play for me was about embracing nature and the connectivity and not just some perception of like indoors and climate control versus outdoors, but shading and these sort of tempered zones that were basically part of the, um, the living cycle, that you would have breakfast or you'd have tea or you'd be indoors at the architectural level, but part of nature. And it wasn't just a disconnect between a binary um, line. Okay. This was a big surprise for me. I grew up in a row home in Washington, as I mentioned, when I was a kid and got to walk to school and bike and all those things. So row homes, side by side, often have little backyards and you can barbecue and you can do some things, but you're not running around. You're not putting giant trampolines out there. You're not playing you know, um, cornhole and doing all the fun stuff. And then the other extreme would be the suburban house, which is a box on a larger lot. This is a side yard house that I found in Hungary. So here's how it works. The street is here, street trees, sidewalks, with an entrance. And it's long and narrow, but it has a yard next to it rather than behind it. So it's like key, it'd be like the black keys on the um, 
keyboard of a piano. They're spaced. You don't walk in the front door when you're on the front porch. You walk in a door that takes you down a covered, it's a colonnade that is shading you from the direct sun and gives you a place to sit and watch, oh, like chickens and children. And it's private because the windows are on the side facing the yard and the wall of the neighbor's house has no windows. So it's this really cool courtyard. And it's the middle density between extreme density of a row home and the least dense suburban house. So whether you like the style or not doesn't really matter. This one goes back to 1865. And then before there were um, cars, they would have carts. Like, you know, horse drawn, you know, mules, all that stuff. And so you'd have, in effect, your garage doors would be where you'd pull in with your stuff. So it has like all the trappings of a um, really interesting mid-density, almost suburban solution. It's not for like the cities because you still need the row homes or the towers with the apartments. But when you look from the side yard in, you would see the columns and the windows and the doors. And they came in all different form factors. So here's one where, you know, the, the columns were a little bit different on the, on the front. But you could sit up front and be part of a community. You could have a glass of wine after dinner. You could have coffee in the morning. And they call it um, in urban planning like the public eye. That instead of having police on every corner, the neighbors were policing each other and the community and the kids because you were participating as opposed to the turn your back and shut the door in your garage or your house in the suburbs or even in the condo where you're expecting some authority figure to make sure that there's no mayhem on the street. City is high density on the left. Side yard house is in this family of mid density and I don't have certainly time today to go into L houses C or U houses, O houses. But the whole point here is, as we look at suburban sprawl when it's relevant for sustainability, we have to be super careful that we don't just use farm land for suburban cul-de-sacs where the houses are splatted around and they're not really placed based on solar orientation for natural light or for passive heating where you get the benefit of the sun in the morning in the afternoon and you can shade with a deciduous tree you know it's like the the developers sometimes just clear the lots with all the trees and they plop these things around and it will be interesting to see if anyone picks up on this thing where it's almost like there were lessons here from hundreds of years ago that we should probably relook at and that was kind of the theme of of learn from looking which is let's not rush into just thinking the cul-de-sac is the way to go because we can build it and we have built it Here's one about community and village life. So coming into Budapest, I saw this incredible um, Danube River split the Buda and the Pest side. But on the way in, I'm going to focus on this area right here with those little dots, because that is the Holoko, which is a very historic village that dates back some thousand years with these side yard houses. The play becomes how we interconnect community with a church, different roof shapes, doesn't matter, all about sort of sub-variables within the bigger picture. And the idea here was to document it in sort of the aerial view from walking and talk about learning and looking, like how they were positioned relative to each other, not just the object itself. Here's one from Prague. So, Looking down the Danube River was about views to both sides. This one was about standing in the center of the public square and over a handful of hours drawing the views from the center of the public square in 360. I can tell you the activity over those four or five hours of people coming in the blockade of cars, meaning it was like a huge shopping mall in a way. We've mimicked cities like 
Prague with Old Town Square with these super malls in a way because they have pedestrian experience and you park on the outside. So it's really interesting to see from, again, sustainability, you could work and live in a very comfortable way without as much car transportation. This is that view from the center. So this little uh, four-story building is that one on the far side. Right, so this is a wrap. Now, this was also in 93 before we had um, phones that would do that. Now you can actually make these. But the idea, again, of how um, the urban center became the focal point for that community and the interaction and reduced the need for transit with combustion you know, engines. Here's a vertical city. Manhattan drew this before the, the tragedy of 9-11. And the idea of how you connect now, not in a lateral way, but looking up and down, and the way these work is on the left side was the one looking south, and the right side looking north towards the Chrysler building, and the idea of, again, interactivity. So all of Manhattan, in a way, is like the super mall, right? Where you can certainly have a car, but it's a lot easier to walk and use public transportation. The flip to, um, the vertical city is the horizontal city of Los Angeles, where while it's green-minded, and there are lots more Prius cars than in any other city probably in the world, it's a big sprawling mess. It used to have the trolleys, it used to have some of that transit system, now you're just stuck in those uh, traffic jams. And there's some really tough lessons there about how we can learn not to do some of the things that they did in Los Angeles. Happy to field some questions about what I've covered so far. What? Yes. Uh, you seem to be a very talented artist. However, Took years of drawing things. I Thank you, though. When I try and get my ideas down, I'm not quite that in that area. Is there, are there other ways that are really good for getting like a mental snapshot without having to explain to somebody that can't draw? Like, hey. Sure, I will tell you the tools are, are sometimes key. So you might be surprised. Like, this holds the ink. And so I would start with much bigger gestures to capture some things as, as notes and then keep finer point um, pens. But it's all done in ink in the field. So it was like less to me art than um, documentation. And I can tell you if you have a um, notebook to write notes, right? Da Vinci wrote notes and used his what off, off hand, wrote backwards, upside down, whatever it was. You don't have to think about an audience to see the thing to necessarily capture the information. So I am so um, much better visually at understanding things that it was natural for me. And with a father that was also an architect, I just learned. I was drawing at a very young age. But taking notes, having in, um, there's a, a movie called Night Shift where uh, I think it's uh, Michael Keaton has a, a recorder. And he would come up with ideas and he would speak into them. And one of them was... Um, he was like, wait a second, um, what if we, um, we put the mayonnaise in the tuna can? And then he goes, wait, feed the tuna fish mayonnaise, call Starkist. Like recording notes could be for you a way to get those good ideas down. Taking them by hand, you know, is also an act of like memory. So if you think about seeing something if it's going through your eye and your brain into your body and out of your mouth or in your hand drawing or writing, it's so much better in terms of storage than taking a picture and assuming you've captured it. I know more about the details of Old Town Square in Prague than people who live there by spending the four or five hours documenting it. And the thousands of people, you can go on Instagram and see the hundreds of thousands of photos of Old Town Square that took it and thought they captured something. Without that photo, it's zeroed out. You know what I'm saying? So that was the idea of this, the idea of pausing with the sort of the learn from looking message. But I don't have any tip other than use your body in some way, whether it's your voice into a recording machine, whether it's written notes, whether it's some way of, um, is it taking pictures at three different times of the day? Like Monet did the Rouen Cathedral where he would paint it at different times. Seeing it in different light is a way to document differently than just the one quick shot with the, um, with the smartphone. And so the, I'm not shying away from using cameras. I use camera all the time. It's just about a tool that is part of the tool belt, not in isolation. Other questions? 
Yes. So, um, I guess in response to your slide about the residential form factor and land use, so one thing I've noticed is like zoning boards and uh, planning commissions on like the local level, local level and the townships. I mean, they have this predetermined notion of you know how things should be zoned and the densities. Absolutely. And things like that. So, I mean, what's what's kind of your response to that, and how do you? Uh, Get over the obstacles that are so I had to personally live it. So I bought an old abandoned church coming out of grad school in a really rough part of, of Philadelphia before they called it Northern Liberties. It was up at 8th and Girard Avenue. And it was next to an old abandoned school and a warehouse. And I thought, okay, I'm going to live there. I'm going to have an architectural practice. I'm going to have my artists that are friends all live there. We're going we're gonna to pull a Warhol, like, um, you know, rebuild at a cultural level this part of Philadelphia. Big fines, they shut us down for having big parties, all kinds of stuff. Like, I mean, it wasn't even funny. Like, like the mayor called me in because we were all in the media. We won the like, hip scene award. I and mean, we had 400 people for parties, like 10 kegs, big parties. I don't, well, for Penn State level, that's not a big party at all. That's, just, that's, a, that's the cocktail party, right, before the <laughs> b football game. But um, I made a case that in European precedence, Champs-Elysees, whatever it was, towns in Florence, there would be some public area, call it a gallery, because we we're having these events, event space for public assembly on the lower levels and retail, because we had a little store there, and then you'd have commercial upstairs and you'd sleep on the third floor or the fourth floor. Mixed use zoning was not something we needed to invent. I was trying <coughs> to build in mixed use zoning in a neighborhood that was owned industrial. You weren't allowed to sleep there. We weren't allowed to even have an office. It was, you were supposed to make shoes or something. It was like ridiculous. So I called it magic marker zoning. They would say, okay, red is like, this is where people like make shoes. And blue is where you sleep. And yellow is like where you serve food. I was like, well, wouldn't it be better to have like restaurants near where people uh, like sleep and want to eat? And so I made the case to uh, then Mayor Rendell and we got the zoning approved. And it set a whole precedent for uh, Northern Liberties, which is now a really great example of mixed use zoning. So... I think uh, tenacity is the, uh, the kind of the, the trigger there that if you can stick with a good idea and you tell enough people and you rattle enough cages, we had some momentum behind us that we kind of, we also took the approach of like you can um, ask for permission or you can um, beg for forgiveness.